I was uh, 29 years old. Woke up like any morning, ate breakfast, and my mom asked me to go out there and cut that grass. About 15 to 20 minutes into cutting the grass, I just happened to look up. And there stood two white gentlemen at the edge of the back porch. I cut the lawn off and I said, can I help you? And one of them replied, we are a detective from the Birmingham Police Department. And I said, okay, how can I help you? And he said, well, we have a warrant for your arrest. On our way to jail, the detective turned around and asked me, Anthony, do you own a pistol? And I said, no. He said, do your mother own a firearm? I said, no. Ah, uh, yes. I said, uh, she owned an old 38 Smith & Wester. My mom gave him the pistol. I asked him to take at least 50 times. Why am I being arrested? Never would respond. I asked him again for the 51st time, why am I being arrested? He said, you want to know why we're arresting you? He said, you robbed a restaurant manager and you killed him. I said, you got the wrong person. I ain't done none of that. He said, let me tell you something right now. I don't care whether you did it or didn't do it. There's five things that are going to convict you. He said, number one, you black. Number two, a white man is going to say you shot him. Number three, you're going to have a white prosecutor. Number four, you're going to have a white judge. And number five, you're going to have an all-white jury. And he said, do you know what that spell? Conviction. And sure enough, they find me guilty. The judge said, Anthony Ray Hinton, it is the order of this court that I sentence you to death. May God have mercy on your soul. The Supreme Court was urged today to strike down the death penalty because it is applied unequally to black and white. It was eight years ago that arrests were made for the murder of a white Atlanta policeman during a holdup at a furniture store. The man convicted of pulling the trigger was Warren McCleskey. He was sentenced to die in Georgia's electric chair. The appeal was based on death row studies showing that those who kill whites are 11 times more likely to be sentenced to die than those who kill blacks. We'll hear arguments first this morning in number 846811, Warren McCleskey versus Ralph Kemp. Once I got involved in representing people on death row, it was McCleskey that began to illuminate the ways in which our history of racial inequality was limiting the commitment of the rule of law and disadvantaging people of color. What was surprising is that the United States Supreme Court didn't question the data. The court said, even though we believe you, we're not going to strike down the death penalty because a certain amount of bias in the administration of the death penalty is, in our opinion, quote, inevitable. And as a young lawyer working on that case, that was a real um, crisis. It felt like the court was abandoning the commitment to equal justice. It was abandoning the commitment to racial equality. I believe that there is a presumption, at least in southern states, that Georgia prosecutors, uh, juries, and district attorneys cannot fairly and impartially uh, administer the death penalty. And I'd like to tell you that it's not 1950 anymore. We can fairly and impartially administer the laws as narrowly drawn under our Constitution. Mr. Stevenson, do you have a question? What has changed that allows you to support or assert that the death penalty is being fairly applied now in ways that it wasn't being applied in 1950? First of all, as I'm sure you know, Mr. Stevenson, we have more white persons incarcerated on death row for murders than we do for black people. So but how does that disprove that race is not a factor? The bottom line is that there are only 27 percent of the black of the population of Georgia is black. First Yet 75 percent of the people that have been executed in that state are African American. That's 25 percent more than the people who committed murders, and it's 50 percent more than the people who exist in that state. So, do you want an answer to your question, or do you want to tell me your? I want an answer to a question, but I want an, an honest answer. Your point of view is that no person who is a black person in Georgia can get a fair trial, according to you. You want to go into generalized statistics because you cannot face the fact, as an attorney, that there are people who should be held accountable of their actions regardless of their race. Mr. Glasser. 
The court in McCleskey said that he failed because he didn't prove intentional discrimination on the part of each of the decision makers in his case. And we started thinking about that. It was like, well, how do you prove that? Well, we need to start asking questions about the decision makers. So we started asking questions of judges. Have you ever used the N-word? Have you ever hired people of color to be clerks? Did you pull your kids out of the schools when integration came? And the same questions were appropriate for the prosecutor. And no one wanted to answer those questions. I was persuaded, and still am, that the criminal justice system revealed the problems of our history of bias against the poor and people of color, unlike few systems do. In the state of Georgia, when a black defendant is sentenced to death, and four of the 12 jurors who sentenced him say that the Ku Klux Klan do good things in that community, when that defense lawyer says that I believe my client is genetically predisposed to commit violent crimes and that's why I'm comfortable with his death sentence, when the trial judge and the prosecutor refer to that black defendant as colored boy throughout the trial, that's racial bias. Okay. And Ms. Ms. Bowling, would you like to... I think of McCleskey as a critical moment in the court's relationship to not only the rule of law and the Constitution, but to race. I had a hard time reconciling this commitment to equal justice under law with this doctrine of inevitability. And what that ruling meant is that not only was there not going to be an end to the death penalty, it meant that Warren McCleskey would likely be executed. And I've had some hard moments, but that stands out. It created a sort of injury. An execution date was scheduled and Warren McCleskey was executed. We are haunted in America by our history of racial inequality. For me, it actually begins with the fact that we're a post-genocide society. I think what happened to Native people on this continent was a genocide. We forced these communities from land through war and violence we didn't call it a genocide because we said, no, these native people are different. They're a different race. And we use this narrative of racial difference to justify the abuse, the exploitation, the destruction of these communities. And that narrative of racial difference is what then made slavery in America so problematic. And you cannot understand slavery in America without understanding the role that the United States Supreme Court played in making slavery acceptable, making slavery moral, making slavery legal. Slave owners in the American South wanted to feel like they were moral people. They were Christians. And to feel that, and still be owning other people, they had to say that black people are different than white people. And that was ratified by the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision. The Supreme Court says in 1857, look, black people are an inferior race. They're not like white people. They're three-fifths human. And because of that, they're not citizens. They are not protected by the Constitution. And that decision not only allowed slavery to persist, but it created a racial hierarchy. It introduced formally in the law this idea of white supremacy, this narrative of racial difference. We then had this bloody civil war. The North prevails. We passed the 13th Amendment, which ends involuntary servitude and forced labor. We passed the 14th Amendment, which is supposed to provide equal protection. We passed the 15th Amendment, which is supposed to give people the right to vote. And the reaction to that in many parts of this country was violent. In 1873, in Colfax, Louisiana, 150 black people are murdered by a white mob because they were protesting their inability to be politically represented. Congress says, you know, we can't allow that kind of violence. We're going to have our federal prosecutors prosecute those people for that violence. And white people are convicted. 
And the United States Supreme Court says no. Congress doesn't have the authority to prevent that kind of violent intimidation. States have rights, and the federal government can't impinge on those rights. So this era, I think, does something significant to the credibility, the integrity of the United States Supreme Court. It became a tool for sustaining racial violence, white supremacy, and exploitation of black people.